I love how small this is. Well, that's not good. For this build, we'll be using a mid-range component and we've actually decided to go an all AMD system with a Ryzen 7 uh, 5700X, which is an eight core 65 watt TDP chip. And we'll be using the latest GPU from the AMD as well, which is the 6750XT, which is just a slightly better binned 6700XT. The beauty of this kind of system is when you use AMD CPU and AMD graphics card, there's a lot of synergy between the components and you can actually get slightly better performance across the board. So I can't wait to get into it. In terms of the components, we've actually decided to go something mid-range where it's not the most expensive, it's also not the cheapest, but it's all very balanced. That's why we have a B550 motherboard. We've got the chip here and again, the mid-range graphics card. And the trend is gonna carry on going through the build as well. For this, we're using a Silverstone case. And this case actually has something up its sleeve. It can fit a 360 mil radiator all across the side, which is gonna be very interesting. With the chip that we have here, which is 65 watts, it will actually be able to make this system basically silent. Let's get right into it. So we'll quickly set up the motherboard. Uh, I said we're using a B550i, which actually includes Wi-Fi, so it's gonna be a pretty good little system. We're gonna start with the CPU. Take the little triangle, line it, good to go. It's gonna be very loose. Might as well start getting the RAM in place. So we've got 16 gig of DDR4 RAM, uh, clocked at 3600 mega transfers. And lastly, just below this heat sink, we should have the M.2 drive. And since this is an older ASUS board at this point, we are almost due for a new generation, um, it's still using screw-in M.2 drives. As I mentioned, we're going for a more budget kind of friendly approach. So we're actually installing only a 256 gigabyte NVMe drive, which is gonna be only there for the booting operating system. The rest of the storage is gonna be all on a mechanical drive. I've got a four terabyte uh, hard drive to the side, which will mount inside of it later on. For the heating, make sure to peel off the little plastic cover because it's meant to be peeled off for the film pad. That's the main motherboard portion of the case then. I love how small this is. Well, that's not good. So that happened, uh, but um, it's nothing that a blade and a bit of time can't fix. I did have a few bent pins, so be careful if that happens to you. But hey, we are professionals here. Kinda. Let's move on with the rest of the build without turning the motherboard upside down. Rookie mistake. Next, we're gonna take apart the case itself. So it actually has a little magnetic panel on top and then thumb, thumb screws all around then help remove the panels itself. Um, what's interesting about this case, it actually does not come with a manual, or at least not a printed manual. Um, Silverstone's gone down the way of just providing information where to download it. So I've got my laptop over there, and I'll be carefully following the guide to set everything up. Right, I hope this comes off. Yep, this seems to come off. I think every single panel in this case comes off, so that's convenient. Yeah, the back panels also with a thumb screw. So all metal panels come off with a thumb screw. All plastic panels come off just with little knobs and um, magnets. So next step is, well, the frame is actually really light and the next step for us is installing the power supply. So here we're using Cooler Master V650, just a smaller effects power supply. 
One thing to consider, this system supports a maximum of SFX L power supply. This is just a normal SFX power supply, so we should have some spare space. As you can see, you can fit a longer version, but the beauty is now we have a bit more space to cable manage all the, well, cables. So it makes it a bit easier. Uh, so we'll probably do the cables a bit later on. Uh, let's next put in the motherboard. But before that, we actually need to remove this frame or bracket and that will be used for installing the 360 mil radiator a bit later on. Next we're installing the motherboard and so we don't take any risks we're going to put it flat so it's just a little bit safer. With the motherboard mounted you can actually see that you can fit a much larger motherboard I think this is an MATX size that you can do which is pretty cool, it opens up this case to many more possibilities because what you find is with smaller motherboards it's actually just generally harder to find a good deal. MATX is pretty common and you don't have to use up all the expansions, you can just use one and leave the rest open but it gives you a lot more space. So next what we're going to do is install the hard drive. So I've got a 4TB Seagate Iron Wolf NAS drive, it's just one of the ones I've had laying around, but it'll be perfect for Steam Library and an Ensem. So what we're going to do, we're going to install it instead of one of the um, fan slots. I'm actually going to mount it down this way. So there's two positions here. You can mount SSDs as well, or two fans. So there's a position here and a position here. Mounting it here will limit how much space we have for the cabling. And so instead we're going to mount it over this end Kind of just for easy cable management later. So kind of important to think about your ease of life later on. Coming to Silverstone, um, you guys provide all the screws, which is great, um, but they're not sorted. Uh, it's just a bag with all the screws. Um, not a fan. Um, wish they were sorted so you could just quickly pick up the hard drive screws, motherboard screws, etc. Though, like to give some credit where credit is due. Um, Silverstone actually routed this audio cable all the way at the back and it kind of comes out here and it's already cable tied at the back here. And it's in a perfect position, just kind of slot across and plug in on this motherboard right here. And what happens is then you just kind of slot it below and a graphics card will just hide it below there, which is a very nice little touch. One of the things I like with the Asus mobile boards, they actually do this little front header split out cable. So the header goes straight in and then they're actually labeled up so you can easily connect your front IO to these headers, which is just a nice little touch. And because it's extended, you don't have to mess around on the mobile board. You can just deal with it underneath the mobile board. That's exactly what we're gonna do now. Just gonna plug it in, just go right here. And you can't get it wrong, there's only one slot where this sits and you just kind of throw it behind the motherboard. Nice, nice and neat. Since the CPU fell out on me already, I put some masking tape to hold it in place because the cooler is actually gonna be one of the last components that goes in in this case. And I need to keep flipping the case now just to do all the cabling. Do not fall out, please. It's got a cat's hairs in it as well. That overclocks it by 10%. For the schooler that we're using, which is the Be Quiet Pure Loop 360mm, um, it has its own little mounting bracket. So we need to remove the original brackets from the motherboard and swap them out for the ones from Be Quiet. So we'll just take a few seconds to do that. All you do is you put these little extensions on. Then you put the bracket with the step pointing, with the connector pointing towards the CPU. Just the screws in. Then these just screw into the motherboard backplate, and we're going to have a fully secured bracket. Well, the mount installed. And this is what I mentioned earlier the fact that it has a little IO extender on this motherboard. You just plug in every single thing outside of the motherboard, and it's just nicely labeled. Good job, Silverstone and Asus, for making this so easy. Um, IO is probably the most annoying thing to do when you're doing a build, even for somebody who's made, you know, dozens of them. Um, this is still an annoying thing, but this makes it easier. So I like that. Thank you. Genuine thank you for that. Next on the list is installing a cooler. 
and as the cooler is going along this side and this fan down here is actually blowing air upwards throughout the whole chassis that means what we want to do is actually get these fans to take the air and blow through the hot radiator get, just getting the heat out of the case so what i'm going to do is since this mount here this way so that means i need to mount everything along like that there you go so we're just installing all three fans as a exhaust then we'll put the bracket over the top and then all of this is going to be mounted all together and go straight into the case just want to make sure that i can fit it all in something to consider about radiators like this uh, be quiet has its pump separate from the actual block or the radiator so it's kind of sticking out a bit in a case which has limited amount of space the pump might actually be interfering or at least not as comfortable to install so we'll do a quick test fit i'm going to throw the block over pull the cables in just for the sake of it and then basically line it up and just to see if it works. So in, in practice, yeah, that fits. But then this is the thing to consider. We're kind of bending it quite a bit here. So just need to be careful. We don't actually damage anything. All I need to do is we might need to just bend it up, turn it over. This one's adjustable and then put the block in. So we're going to start with the block anyway. Now we're ready for applying the thermal paste and carry on. When mounting 316 mil radiator, make sure to pre-plan where the tubes are going. So we had to push them over to the top side here to ensure that they don't interfere with the RAM and just kind of move the tubes away from the graphics card, which is going over here. And then once it's all in, you just lower it in place. It's actually very satisfying in this case. Uh, all the components I picked fit in really nicely. And even though there's a big radiator and a bunch of components. It, there's still like, I can put a finger down here and there's a few mil of space down below. Uh, makes it very easy to work in. Uh, the only consideration is like cabling, but even then, uh, if you're using a water cooling like this, um, this is a closed case, so you can just run half cables running whatever you want. Uh, I like the meat, but you um, don't really have to. Space-wise, you have plenty in there. Good. Put the full hand in there now because of the water cooling. Last but not least is the graphics card. And for this, what I'm going to do is to make it a bit easier for my cabling, I'm actually going to plug in the power cables ahead of time. That way I don't need to fish around in a small space. That's it, the case is built. We've got the massive graphics card across the board and we still have about two fingers worth of space left at the back. But one thing to consider Right here, we have the power cables. The original power supply cables are quite rigid, so you have to kind of squeeze them in and bend them and basically molest them into place, which is kind of annoying, but if you use custom cabling, like custom sleeve cable, which is a lot easier and more malleable, it just makes it work a lot easier. So that was one. Then we obviously installed this massive radiator. A few things to consider, as I mentioned earlier, is the tubes and also the power supply cables for the graphics card, which kind of hidden behind now. They're kind of loose and there's nothing really you can do about it. Lastly is the bit at the back. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's nice when you have extra space here so you can hide more cables at the back. And here, we made a mistake first. I had the cables going over and across, forgetting that this is a flat back. So what you have to do is go at the back and use the little Velcros to kind of control your cables and then you go inside the case itself. To be honest, if you use a larger motherboard, you probably would have a bit more struggle to place everything inside, but then it also depends on your cooler. You could have gone for a smaller cooler and have a lot more space just safe from now. So let's close it up and see if it actually boots. Or well, actually, probably should boot without closing because just in case there's any issues. Click the power supply on, and moment. Seems like all fans are spinning. Definitely got some air coming through. 
and hi. We have liftoff. Okay. Next, um, let's put some panels on and do some proper testing after. With the panels on, I actually can't wait to give it a go. And for that, I'm going to use Horizon Zero Dawn. I'm going to set the settings to 1440p as this class of graphics card is not really meant for 4K. Let's see how that goes and see what kind of temperatures we're getting. We're going for the ultimate quality, kind of pushing as hard as we can. And let's see what, what, what performance we get out of this. So Horizon Zero Dawn is a pretty graphically intensive game. I'm feeling a few little stutters, but also this is a 60 hertz uh, display. What we're seeing on average is 100 FPS, with GPU hitting around 60 degrees, with a hotspot around 75, which is way below what the maximum should be. At the same time, if you look at the CPU package, it's only drawing 65 watts, which is exactly its TDP, but it's only 54, 57, low, high 50s in temperature, which is pretty good considering I'm gaming. What we can do is actually change the settings down to 1080p, that will stress the CPU a bit more and kind of leave it off from the graphics card. And see if we can push the CPU harder. So our FPS has gone up by about 40%, 50%. Uh, the CPU, as you can see now, is already drawing 71 watts. And it's still 59 degrees, 60. Okay, so we hit 60, it's gone past 60. So we're definitely hitting it much harder. It's more reliant now on the CPU. Um, the graphics card is actually doing about the same. Uh, 60 average uh, degrees and 73 on the hotspot. What we can do next is we'll turn off the game and we'll put on some stress tests and see how far we can push both the CPU and the graphics card uh, in this case and see what the performance is, uh, both for the components that we have and also if this kind of mesh uh, case got good airflow. So for stressing out the system, we've got hardware info to track the data and we're gonna run Cinebench R23 on loop. So let's just loop this, so bench. So we've got some data and yeah, we're gonna run R23 on loop for the multi-core test, which will stress out the CPU. And at the same time, we're gonna put on Fermark on 1440p and just get that running to stress out the graphics card. Therefore, we're going to push the temperatures to its max. So we can tra track it here. We can instantly see that both CPU and GPU is now gone up in temperatures. And we're going to come back about 20 or 30 minutes to see where they end up. It's been 35 minutes and it's still running in the background, so I'm not going to stop that. But looking at the CPU temperatures, we are averaging at approximately 60 degrees, 61 degrees with a maximum of 66. It's actually at 61 degrees right now, and it's literally running the render at the same time. When it comes to GPU, we actually get 62 degrees Celsius, which is its top temperature as well. This is really good, and there's still headroom for overclocking if needed. Next thing to consider is sound performance, and this case is actually delivering really good results. If we were to compare it, the graphics card is probably slightly louder, and that's because it's using three smaller size fans. Rather than telling you how it sounds, well, just have a listen. To me, it's a distant hum, so it's pretty good. And that's with it being pressed to the max. So there's definitely opportunity here to overclock both CPU and GPU. And I think if we really wanted to, we'd probably push it by five, probably about 5% without really trying too hard. Alternatively, we're actually thinking about placing this in the living room to work as a Xbox replacement. And with this in mind, we'll probably turn down the fans to make it even more quiet, to be just perfect for the living room environment. It goes without saying, I really like this case. It is still pretty small as far as the footprint is concerned, and it delivers results that I'm pretty happy with. There is one thing that you need to be aware of. If you do overclocking or you need to do some troubleshooting, to access the power supply uh, button to turn it off, is what well, you need to take off this side panel, then press the button. So if you have an issue or you need to turn off the PC in emergency, the best you can do is just pull out the power cable at the back, which isn't great, but this is what you get with an inverted case. I don't know about you guys, but I'm gonna go set this up in the living room and start playing some games. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, I hope you found this useful. 
Um, don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you guys in the next one.